Hello, and welcome to another 8-minute demo. Today we're going to be talking about the integration pack for standard OIS logging that's up there on CodePlex. My name is Charles Joy. I'm a Senior Business Development Manager at Microsoft. Today we're going to be adding to the user guide and the usage guide here for the standard OIS logging integration pack that you can see we're at CodePlex. I will post the URL for this, but I just wanted to show you that it is up on CodePlex. I posted it in June of last year, so um, I know it's taken a while to get to the video portion of this, but the user guide and the usage guide are pretty good and comprehensive. I just want to give you a little example so I can refer to it in video form. Um, I will walk actually through the process of getting the table and the start procedures installed as well. So you start at a new database. It's recommended. You can use an existing database. We highly discourage the use of the Opalis database because you don't want to mess with that schema. So we just create a new database. It could be on the same server. That's fine. And you can see I just created this and there's nothing in it. But I'm going to use it for my standard OIS logging database table and sort of procedure. Simple enough. We're just going to go open those files and I had navigated out to this previously but as the usage guide and the user guide say that the files get automatically installed you just have to deploy the scripts whether you use an integration pack or you use just SQL Management Studio it's up to you but it's in this path program files common files PAL software PAL integration server extension support bin so we're in the bin we have five files that we need to bring in and they're labeled I have some other stuff in here too from a different integration pack but these are the ones we need so it is anything with the standard OS logging name in it alright we'll bring we'll open those up and we're just gonna have to navigate by name here this is the first one so we're gonna create the table you can see we are in the Opalis logging. Go ahead and close that once done. There's the second one. There's the third one. This is the fourth one. And finally the fifth. The reason you do them in order is because there's some dependencies there. You can figure them out for yourself. It's not a big deal, but recommend going in order. Once you're finished with that, you, we can refresh and there should be a table, very basic table, and there will be some start procedures, three start procedures, insert, select, and update that are used by the integration pack. So once you have this complete, you're good to go. You could close SQL unless you want to take a look at what's in these tables. So right now, there'll be nothing. <laughs> once we start using it, I'll pop back in here. So I'm just going to minimize this. The next step, you can see I've already created a folder for the demonstration, but we have to go ahead and once you've deployed the integration pack, this, is, this video assumes that you've done that already and maybe have not created the table yet, so we're still in the configuring stage here. So we go to standard OS logging. This is a kick based IP, so we have to use the kick interface uh, that you, you, you might be used to now with the VMM or the DPM integration pack. So we're going to go and name this. Doesn't matter, that's just the name of the, the connection. And then we're going to choose the settings, and then you fill in this based on your environment. My environment, that is the server name, the database name, and we'll go back just to be clear. It is opalis underscore logging. And I'm using a trusted connection, and I will not be outputting to the file system, which is essentially it, it would write to both the table and a log file where you want to write it to, and you get to choose the path and stuff. But I'm going to leave that to false for this demonstration finish and then we're good to go now all the standard OS logging objects are ready to be used and if you wanted to test it you can go ahead and do, use the get log data test the connection that is and choose standard OS logging and no filters and you can use the testing console to see that the connection works it should return zero because there's nothing in that table and you can see a log count zero so we're good to go there. If it failed, then there's something wrong with the connection. You want to take a look at that. And yes, I know there is no test connection button for kick based integrations right now, but that's the, the fastest way to do a test for kick based integrations. Find a Git object and then run it and see what you get. All right. Well, we're going to uh, just this first example is just to explore the different objects that are available. We already saw the Git log data. The names of the objects should be pretty self explanatory. Git will get the values that are in that table and it'll publish that data back on the data bus. Restart is special because it actually uh, pre filters things out 
based on whether or not they have the restart flag requires restart flag already flipped. It's intended to be used to check to see what needs to be restarted and then kick off another policy based on the restart data. And then we have our the logging stuff. So there's start, success, warning, failure, and end. To give you a little deep dive into this, start inserts a record into the table, success updates that record with success, warning updates the record with warning, failure updates it with failure, and also you have the option to um, flag it as restart for both of those warning and failure objects and then end completes the record essentially saying that this record's done you could uh, create a new one or whatever and that's more for reporting purposes and then of course you can get that data and parse that data using the get log data object the crucial ones for this are start and end from a logical standpoint the crucial one from a technical standpoint is start because you have to insert the record first. That gives it an ID. That ID can be passed to success, warning, failure, end, and whatnot. These two objects would be used outside of the workflows for uh, reporting or restart purposes. So we'll get to usage of these and, uh, in the next section. Now we're going to take a simple workflow that uh, is very much for demo purposes, but we have a custom start, a ping, we're going to restart a service and then we're going to execute a program. Now this may be something you string together in one of your processes or something similar, but for demo purposes and for the usage of this integration pack, we're going to use these three objects. Um, and we're going to break them up into a couple different workflows so that one workflow we get the ping and the next work wor workflow we get the restart service and the next one we execute. And this is just symbolizing the best practice where we break up the workflows into restartable bits and um, we'll uh, use this standard OIS logging to make the workflow restartable at certain points. So we have this workflow and um, it has no standard OIS logging objects in it right now but we're going to add them into the three policies you see up top. So I'm just going to grab these guys and put them in their own link them up and I'm just going to grab these guys and then I'll delete them from the first one. So now we have three separate policies doing one process and now we're going to add the standard OS logging to this. Some of the objects. When you start then essentially we're starting and then we're going to do something and now this is where we can add our success our warning and our failure but we're not going to add a complete because this is not the end of the process you got to remember the complete is for completing the record and for our prop purposes here we're going to complete the record after all three of the processes after all three of the policies are complete and the process is complete and you may not need all of these but I want to you know, showcase each one of them and of course we're going to need a trigger object to go to the next policy but only upon success so let's start configuring we're not going to pass anything in so we'll leave that custom start but for the start object we want to pass in some things and there's some defaults here that you could take advantage of like the policy name because you're going to want to know because you might be logging on a bunch of different policies you're going to want to know what the policy name is and that's simple enough we right click subscribe publish data common published data and then we're going to take a look at the published data item for policy name and stage is really meant to take advantage of parsing that policy name into what stage it is and you could see that we have standard OIS logging policy 1, policy 2, policy 3 and there's a delimiter there and it's space uh, pipe space so we can take advantage of that so I'm going to expand and I'm going to do a uh, field function based on the policy name and our delimiter is going to be space, pipe, space. And then we want the second field, which will be policy one, policy two, policy three. And that is what will go into the stage. So when we look at the stage field, it'll say either policy one, policy two, policy three. You can do whatever you want there. And that's why we recommend using some sort of delimiter to um, not only delimit and possibly version of the policy, but the stage of that policy in the overall workflow or the overall process.
Now we have a bunch of optional properties we can add. A job ID and custom fields 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now we're going to go with just uh, job ID and custom field 1 because we don't have that much data to add. And job ID is basically your concatenation of a bunch of different terms or unique things for this policy. Like you can use stage. I'll just copy that. And something else unique, you could put the date and time in there if you want. But we're, we are tracking date and time in there. So anything you need to make it unique for your specific run. If you're pulling specific data from a database table, you might want to add a piece of that in there, the record number or some sort of ID. For this, I'm just going to add the PID in here so we have a little bit more information. And that's the process ID here. And that'll be that. So it's going to be the policy one and then the PID. And that, that's going to be our ID for this. It's not going to be a big deal there. Then custom field one, we're starting, so there's nothing in here, but we can put the word started successfully if you want. It doesn't really matter. I'm just putting something in there so you can see. Hit finish. And now we're getting to where we're actually doing something. So after you start it, then you're going to perform some action. It doesn't matter what it is. We're just using the ping object here. So we're going to actually just use the local host. You could you could use a variable, you could pass the data in from the custom start object, it doesn't really matter. For demonstration purposes, we're just doing localhost. And now this is where making the links do what you want is important. So this is fine because we're going on success. You could break it down to success or percentage of packets is greater than you know, 50% if you wanted to do that. I know it's going to be 100% because I'm on this machine, but you could add that sort of information in there. And it's best, for the best practice, to color code and name your link. So this is the success link. And now if we expand this out a bit, you can see it said ping successfully. Now we have the warning and failure routes. So for warning, Let's just change this to warning as opposed to success. Now, this object won't have a warning, but I want to show you that's what you can do. You could also add in other parameters where you're saying percentage of packets lost is between 25 and 50. Whatever you want to do there, it doesn't really matter. And then, of course, name your link and color code it maybe orange. And finally, for failure, this is going to be a failure. And this is overkill, but I want to show you can add different things. Percentage of packets equals zero. Obviously, it'll vary by the object. And you can make it red. And you can see they're sort of overriding each other, so you can uh, move these around as needed if you need to make it look fancy. Uh, you can certainly do that. So that'll work for this uh, this layout here. So we're good to go with the links. Now we need to parse data that's coming across the data bus and put it, you know, update that record that we're creating in the database table for this log. Let's do success first. We're going to grab the OIS login demo. And the first thing it's asking is for the logging ID. So that is published data from the start object, which is all important. We're going to grab the OIS login ID. And then optional properties, we can change that. We can leave everything alone, policy name and stage and job ID, but we can update the uh, custom field one and maybe add something to a custom field two. So remember, we had something in custom field one, so we'd want to get that published data so we're not overwriting it because they will overwrite. And we'll grab it right from here, custom field one. I'm going to expand this out and then I'm going to say uh, action successful. And in, as opposed to being vague, we can say the object name from get computer IP status. So it'll say object name, whatever the object name's name is, action successful. That's nice. And then in custom field two, we could put whatever we want in there. And let's say we put in the computer to ping and we give it a little label. And of course we could add a third field, which is going to be uh, packets received, percent packets received. And we just get that from the published data. All right, we're done with that one. So now we have to do the warning and failure. Same sort of story. Again, we need the login ID. 
and we're not in this case we're not going to have the policy require a restart because it's just a warning but you have the option to choose true or false there and then we're going to update that second field like we did or that first field like we did before and we will um, follow suit with two and three because obviously it'll only go down this path if uh, specified now to save a little time I'll copy and paste so I'm going to copy that success stuff put it in the warning but I'm going to obviously modify it and I'm not going to be too uh, specific with my syntax I'll just leave that and then field two I'll go grab that and this is going to remain the same because the data is the same computer pinged and then the packets that might be nice to know and again you could do this more manually I'm just copy and pasting and saving a little time and even for this one let's add the custom field 4 because there's an error there's some sort of error or warning so we'll do warning and we'll choose the error summary text in the common published data which we'll do for the the um, the failure as well so same exact thing for failure so let's go ahead and do that We'll start, get ready for the copy and paste round here. So, same thing, ID. I'm just going to paste it in since it's the same. For this, we have the default set to true for restart. If you don't want it to be flagged for restart, then you don't have to, but we'll leave it for true so we have some data to look at with the other objects. And then I'm going to grab one fields 1, 2, 3, and 4. Leaving the job ID, policy name, and stage the same because those, aren't cha those don't change based on the status of the workflow. So, let's copy this stuff, change it to failure. We got three more copies here. Three more pastes. Try to do this as quickly as possible. And of course I'm going to change that from warning to failure. On this one I'll even expand it so we can see this is going to be failure. Alright, so we're done with all of these objects. Now we just need the trigger policy which we can't do yet because we don't have that custom field, uh, custom start object finished with a second policy. So I'm going to check this in to save it for now. But to save time, I'm going to pre-configure the other ones, and then we'll just look at what I've done as opposed to you know walking through each step by step and copy and paste and getting dizzy and stuff like that. So I think it'll save a lot of time, and we'll get right to that next. So as we can see here, I've uh, pre-configured the policy two and policy three, but now I'll walk you through exactly uh, what I did. Um, you know. So the first thing I did was create custom start parameters, and I did log ID, input custom field ID, and computer. So the computer was obvious because I want to pass the computer from policy to policy. Uh, log ID I needed uh, so that first record that we created, the ID can be passed from one policy to the next, and we can use it in these logging objects from the second policy and the third policy. And then input custom field one, I just named it that. It didn't matter what it was named, but I am grabbing the data from the custom field one field, and then going to put that into the custom field one so I can just grow the data that's in custom field one as opposed to replace it. And I'll show you how I use that. So first things first, I go back, and we'll take a look at how I triggered this policy what I passed in so for log ID I grab results of the OIS logging ID from the start object and then the input custom field one I grab the results from the custom field one of the success because we're writing something here we're adding to it here and then I'm going to pass what we've added the total field into the trigger policy so we can continue adding to it and the computer I just grabbed it from the ping or the ping object there now pretty self-explanatory here I went ahead and uh, grabbed the computer from the start object. I chose print spooler. It doesn't really matter. We're just giving an example. And then I, of course, did the links, making you know decisions based on what kind of objects this was and what determined success, warning, and failure. That will vary by your situation and what objects you use. And, of course, I filled in the warning, failure, and success objects. We'll dive into those now. So for the success object, we have quite a few things f filled out here. So the mandatory field was OIS login ID. We used the log ID from the custom start object. And then I updated or replaced, depending on what data was pulled in, custom fields 1, 2, 3, policy name, and stage. For custom field 1, I took the data that was coming from that first policy, and I'm appending to it the similar data that we've done 
uh, for these objects. So object name, action successful. So it'll just daisy chain that data in there. For custom field 2 and 3, I just modified what we did for 2 and 3 in the previous policy, but made it fit for the action we're taking here, which is restarting the service. And then for policy name and stage, I want to keep these up to date because policy name is different. Obviously, we're in the second policy, and stage is different. We're in policy 2 now as opposed to policy 1. All right. So we have the warning, which is very similar. So log ID, we're leaving it false. Again, we're appending to that custom field, updating custom field 2 and 1, or replacing the data with the warning data. And then, of course, custom field 4 has the warning and then the error summary. And then again, because the branches are exclusive, either warning, failed, or success, we've got to update the policy name and stage with the same data in case it fails out. We need to know where it is. And then for failed, it's the same thing just modifications. Now, as I thought about it, uh, if we did want to update the job ID field, we can do so by appending the PID from one to the next to the next. It's the same way you would append it from the uh, custom field one. You just would need to pass it from the custom start to trigger, custom start to trigger, and then you know append to it as you go on. Uh, it's up to you if you want to do that. Um, I'm not doing that here. I'm just grabbing the PID from the start, and then we're moving on. Again, the job ID is specific to you and your use case, and you could do whatever you want with it. I am then triggering the policy three and passing in information. I'm going to pass in again the results from the success. So once again, we started in the first policy. We updated it with the success from the first policy. Now we're updating with the success from this policy. And then we're going to trigger uh, based on the results from this object. And then we'll keep appending, so on and so forth. There's log ID and computer, as we would expect. And then we can check this one in. Now we go to policy three. It's the same stuff, different object. I made uh, some tweaks based on the object. There's nothing really different here. And I'll add these workflows to blog post anyway, so you can take a look at them. You can see, everything's the same there. We're once again updating the policy name and stage in each of the objects, because if it fails at this level, we'll know that we at least made it to the last level, so on and so forth, or the stage, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. The difference between this policy and the first two is there is no end object in those, and there's an end object here, which this completes the record. So if we're successful all the way through, we get to update the end object, which means it sets the status for that record to complete based on the ID that we've passed along in each of the other two workflows. And um, we are once again updating the custom field one with the results of the success. And this time, I'll just put complete. Add a little bit something for you for configuration. All right, we can check that in. And now these workflows are ready for logging. So they're going to log everything. And then based on success and failure, it'll go down whatever route it has to. Now, the only thing we haven't touched yet is the uh, get or the restart. But let's uh, run through this first, and then we'll get to those. All right, so we're going to run the first one through the testing console, knowing full well that it won't trigger the next one. Uh, but we'll get to see what that data looks like in the table. So I'm going to hit test, and then we're going to just step through. All right, so we have the first object. You can see the data that we're passing in. There's policy one, policy one, and then the PID, and then the policy name, and start successfully, we actually hard coded. So what next? And now, before we move on, we'll actually go look at this table. You can see a record has been inserted with the logging ID of 1, start date, last update time, no end time, uh, status is 0 at start, stage, all that data has been inserted. And now we'll hit next. It'll ping. And then we can see it'll write the success. And then, of course, it won't trigger. But what we'll do is trigger the next one, and we'll pass in this information. So I'm going to copy this. All right. We can hit next, but it's not going to do anything. Now we'll test the second one. 
So log ID was one. Custom field data. And I'm just going to type localhost. No, since in three starting. And now it's going to write to the table. And obviously it won't trigger, but I'm going to grab the data again. Actually, I'm just going to grab what I need and hit next. All right, before we move on, let's take a look at what we have here. You can see the update time is different. We're still successful. Now we're at stage two. Policy name, job ID is the same because we passed it through. And you can see the custom field one has grown and we added some stuff to custom field two and three. We're going to go back and we'll test the last one. All right, and we just log ID is one, computer is local host, and then we're going to just paste in the stuff. Oh, that's good. So it couldn't do a dir on the temp drive, so it went down the failure, and uh, now we'll get to see what happens when it fails. This is not the logging failing, it's actually doing what it was supposed to because we had a failure route. So let's take a look. It should write failure to there. And it did. So now when we go look at the data, now we have a flag for requires restart because it did fail. We still don't have an end date because it didn't complete. Status is failure. And where did it fail? Policy 3. What was the policy name? Job ID is the same. And then you could see the custom field 1 was updated. And we could see that sort of a library of what has happened so far. It's a, it ends in failure. And then we can see what actually happened uh, in the, the failure field we want. So all of that stuff is logged there. So if we copy this into Notepad, let's take a look at what it, what it says. So I couldn't find the file specified, which is just a generic error. So I went ahead and fixed the issue that was causing this. It was actually um, the Palace Remote Execution Service was kind of stuck, and uh, I uh, had to uh, remove some logon credentials that were there for some reason, and then I stopped and started it, and it seems to be working now. So uh, we'll go ahead and move to the next section, which is actually using the Git or the restart objects to gather information. Because we had a failure, we have requires restart as flag, so that's good, and we get to see what the other two objects will do. We'll create another workflow here. And I'm just going to create a restart test in here so you can see what it looks like. So I'm going to grab the restart object, figure it, and you can see I do have filters available. I could filter on specific job IDs and things like that, but this will just return the things that are flagged for restart. So if we do a test, hit run should have one record and we do and is the record that we've been dealing with of course and there's the logging ID of one and where did it stop policy three and uh, standard OS logging policy three so we know exactly what stage it's at and we can move on from there so since we've seen the data let's build this into the first one so if we needed to restart at the beginning it can go down a specific path so I'm just going to copy this guy since we already have it. And I'm going to modify this first policy and add some restartability in here. So I'm going to move some stuff around, paste the restart in here, and then add some logic. I'm going to grab the trigger for three. I'm going to put a filter in here at stage. change that to zero so it only start fresh if that's zero and of course I have to add a number two so I'll copy this guy this one will go policy three policy two and it'll only re uh, go down the start path if the restart count is zero. So that's just the logic I built in. You can certainly build in different logic based on what you want. We'll go ahead and check this in to save it. 
and then we'll run it through a test and see that test that it goes down the appropriate route. First thing it's doing is going to query. And then you can see we haven't passed anything in yet, but it did go down the correct route. And since it's a test console, it's not going to trigger that, so we're fine. So I'm glad that will work. And the good news is if it pulls back multiple things to be restarted, it'll parse them out as necessary. So it'll leave it restart, and it'll only be based on the ID that we need to pass in. So let's figure those out. Custom field, there it is. And the log ID is actually going to be the login ID. And then the computer, we did not capture that as a specific field, um, but I know I have that in here somewhere. Computer for command, so I can parse this field. So I'm going to parse custom field 2 for this data there results from custom field 2. I'm going to put a field function around it. Delimiter is colon space and I want the second field. The good news about logging is you can use it to replenish the data or you can log whatever you need um, and what your process is going to uh, require for restartability and things like that. I've lucked out I had it in there so I can easily parse it out. And then of course we need to do from two, same sort of scenario. From the restart, we want the login ID. From the custom field, we want it from the restart, from the custom field one. And from the computer, this we have to do the same thing, so I'm going to actually copy that from the third one. Alrighty, so now we should be good to go. I'll test this again to make sure the data looks correct. And it looks like it does. It pulled in that custom field, it log ID, and the computer name as expected. And obviously it won't trigger that, but we'll go trigger that third one with this information. So as if it would have moved to the next policy. So I'm just going to check that in and save this. I'm going to check this guy in. And then, of course, we're still testing number three. So we'll do a test, step over, copy the stuff from here, paste it in there. Log ID is one. Computer we know is Opalis-63, or localhost, doesn't matter. And now, because we fixed the issue, this should be successful. And now it's going to update it with success, overriding the failure stuff. And we'll take a look at that before we send the end command. So you can see the last update has changed. It's now a status of success, where we are, and the custom field 1 will have all that data like a work log. Custom field 2, 3, and then 4 is the, the fourth field has been, uh, it was an old failure. You could wipe that out if you want. It's going to be in there, but it'll be as a log of what happened. And then we're going to hit uh, the complete. And now that was successful, so we'll go back. Refresh the, what we have here. Requires restart has been cleared out, probably from the start. We have an end time. We're listed as completed. And for custom field one, if we go all the way to the end, actually I'll copy it and put it in a notepad, we have the complete. And you can see the, the work log. It did fail, and then it was successful, and then well, now we're complete. So, uh, of course, that was just based on what I did. <laughs> you know, I created this on the fly. You guys can do whatever you need to uh, as far as logging with timestamps and things like that in those custom fields. It's completely up to you. This should give you a good example of what's possible with the standard OS logging objects. Now, the one object we haven't touched yet is the git object, but it's the same as the restart object, except it's not filtering specifically on uh, restart stuff. So if we take a look, if we do get log data, configure that with no filters. We're just going to have the chance to filter on all these fields. Run the test. It'll get the one record that we have. And I'll run this a couple times uh, through. And so we can show you what the multiple data looks like. So you can see we get this information. Now this would be good if you needed to take some or all of this information, populate it into a report or something like that. Uh, plus you can run um, statistics on the runs, how often it's failed, success, warning, things like that. 
And of course, if you want to get just the things that are flagged for restart, you can do that as well. Now, what I'm going to do is run these as checked in a couple times, and then we'll go and look at the data afterwards. So I'll be right back after I've run this a couple times. All right, I've run it a couple times now. So if we go ahead and keep this, um, no filters, we'll just run this. And there should be like four records in there now. Um, it just ran through each step, each process, and resulted in success. So there's log count is four. We could see there was four. You could see that first one did had remnants of failure, but it is marked as complete. Uh, and you can see the difference in timestamps and the uh, the logging ID and whatnot. And any of the data that you put in here is available to report on with this object. Or if you go directly to SQL and you hit execute, you're good to go. And to show you that that thing I built on the fly for the first policy with restart count equals zero, um, the reason I did that was so that if there was no restarts, it would just go and create a new one. So if we take a look at this, uh, it does check for restart each time, but since there was zero, it goes to the start and then keeps going on with the process. So uh, that, that's one way you can do it. You could also use the get object and see what stage it's at. If there is no stage one, then you can go on. But I think this is an effective way to do that. I might rename this to check restart as opposed to restart. Um, but you get the idea. This is all for example. Uh, I'm going to clean this policy up and export it for you uh, so you have something to work with. None of the objects here are um, difficult to configure. Um, and you can obviously swap things out as needed. Uh, the most difficult part will be configuring these objects as needed. But I will export them since I, as you saw when I filled this in, I do not have specific information here. I'll clean it up, but I don't have any passwords in here, so it's, it's easy enough to share. So that has been a walkthrough, more, more, more of a tutorial than a demo for these objects. I hope you got something out of this, and I hope that the, those who are using this maybe have used it this way, or if you haven't, now you have an idea of how I would use it and how I have used it in implementations. So again, thank you for watching, if you would have endured all these minutes, and um, we'll see you again in another eight-minute demo, quote-unquote. We certainly appreciate you watching. Thank you.